Hi, Dan. How's it going? How you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah, you're recovering? Yeah, uh, decently enough. I mean, the stomach was still a little, uh, a little messed up on, um, when did I do this? Friday. So on Saturday and Friday night, the stomach was still kind of, kind of fucked, but like, it's just like kind of come along with time. And I think once I started getting calories in me, like the rest of it was pretty quick, but like by Friday afternoon, I felt okay. But like any going upstairs or anything like that just required a lot of heavy breathing. It's very hard to catch the breath. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> so is, is, is getting nutrition in a, a bit of an issue for you? Uh, right now it's fine. I mean, I'm surprised there never really was a time where I was like super hungry. Like I've just kind of just been, um, you know, I was nauseous at first and then it was like kind of forcing food down and now it's just kind of been, you know, I haven't really, ate food. it's kind of weird. So, um, <laughs> congratulations. I mean, oh, what, what an outstanding run. Thank you for talking to me. Um, I mean, I've got so many questions. It's untrue. Yeah. So who are you and why did you come over and why the Bob Graham round? Why Tranter's round? Yeah. Where should we start? Who, who is Jack? Uh, so, yeah, so I, um, I'm from, I'm from Connecticut, you know, I'm from New England. Honestly, the town I live in is like a, a less hilly, uh, possibly slightly less aesthetic version of like the Borrowdale Valley. And, okay. um, and yeah, 29, I mean, not a lot to it. I, I didn't run a ton growing up. Uh, I was in the military from until October of 2021. So back in 2019, I, I raced a lot of, I did some traditional ultra races. 2020, uh, I did all FKTs. 2021, I did all FKTs. And I saw a lot of success in the Northeast, where the Northeast US, where the trails are, are very steep. And the mechanics of running are, are fairly similar to the UK. And then I, I got out of the Navy and I, I moved. I, I've lived in my truck for about four years. I moved to primarily to Northern California. And I raced a lot of um, round trip uh, ski mountaineering records on mountains, up uh, mainly Pacific Northwest. And my... I, I raced a, uh, in May. I drove back to the East Coast. And I started, you know, training running full time and I raced a hundred mile route in New Hampshire. That's honestly like very, probably very similar to like the Lakeland's 24 hour record as far as, you know, maybe it's a, it's a little bit more technical, a little bit less vert, but very similar. Um, and Is then the I was planning. Appalachian Trail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Appalachian Trail. It's the, it's the hundred miles in New Hampshire that basically goes over all the 4,000 foot peaks on the Appalachian trail. And, uh, after that, the plan was to go out to Colorado, but I was just kind of projecting out my season and like when I'd be ready for another hundred miler. And I was like, fuck, like I really don't want to do it before mid August and fire season in the U S is kind of like August through October. And so I was like, you know what? I just need to like put racing in Colorado just earlier in the season next year and kind of focus on it then. And, uh, I need to find something that's like not smoky and the, my, because I think because I do so much volume, it just like kind of destroys my, my brain and my memory. Um, but apparently I've been, I, I have known about the Bob for a long time. Like there's some, you know, posts on like some forums in the, in like us forums about like ultra running and trail running. And I, I would like was doing research for the Bob and the Tranter recently. I'd go back and I'd look and I'd be like, oh my God, like I guess I guess I was thinking about this a couple of years ago at least. Um but yeah, so I didn't have any data points with Killian or with Finley. And so I figured the Ramsey was probably most my style because it's like the most rugged and most remote. And so I figured, you know, I'd come over here and I'd I'd do the Ramsey and I, I, I just see how that went. And, uh, I, I think I like whispered to like one person before I left that like, Hey, maybe if the Ramsey goes like crazy, well, then I'll like do the Bob, but it was like, seemed like kind of wild. And, uh, you know, I, I checked out the Ramsey. I came out here at the end of June. I bought a camper van up in Fife and, uh, I went and I lived in Fort William for about a month. And, you know, over the first week I checked out the Ramsey and, uh, I just wasn't a huge fan of it. It's just, 
the extension onto the Tranter is just, it's a lot of like off trail and uh, there's some road running. It's like, just not, I didn't think it was that great, but I thought the Tranter was just one of my favorite routes I've ever done. It's just so beautiful and it's such great running. And so I decided to modify and, and just race the Tranter because Finley had raced it multiple times and had some great times on it. And, uh, yeah, I got the, got the Tranter record. And then, you know, just doing the math, I was like, I was like, I think as the distance, my theory was, as the distance goes longer, I will be increasingly faster than Finley. And then the, the reverse is, is definitely true. I think he's much better than me at the shorter stuff, just based on the, the races he does and the training he conducts. And so I was like, okay, the Bob is longer and he was seven minutes off Killian's time. And on a short, on the Tranter, I was 14 minutes ahead of him. So just by that math, I was like, you know what? I'm, at least I'm in the conversation for the Bob. So I might as well give it a shot. And I, I knew even if the Bob was my number one priority, I knew I wouldn't be able to get uh, enough pacers, like not having any races or data points like in the UK. So I knew I had to race something else before I did it. So um, uh, yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. So Amazing. And um, what about, I mean, how, did you recce the Bob? I mean, what, what sort of research were you able to do in that time frame? Yeah. So I, uh, I, I think my, my thinking was going into it that, um, there's just no way Billy Bland's time could have been that fast just based on the fact like he did it in the eighties. Like when, you know, there was no, you know, studies about nutrition and training and tactics for running were just, I mean, records from five years ago are almost like soft by default, just because so much has changed. It turns out Billy's time is like <laughs> multiple generations ahead, in my opinion. Um, and it just really is that fast. So when I, when I came here, I felt like there was, there was a, there was a decent chance. And so I, I just downloaded, I just went on Strava and I just like pulled, um, GPS files, GPX files for like Beth, Finley, Killian and George Foster. And I just like overlaid all of them in a mapping application with like a bunch of like, you know, s slower bobs. So I can kind of see where the traditional lines are. And yeah, I just, I ran the thing, you know, in pieces. I probably saw the whole course at, at least three times. Uh, some, some parts I was still a little bit, tiny bit vague on. I never had gone on broad stand, but yeah, I, I knew it decently well. And I, I told my pacers, I told them I wouldn't be going for it before September 10th. And I was like, I just need to like within between September 10th and October 10th, there will be a window and I just need to be patient and I need to increase my recovery from the Tranter and I need to like get a full like training cycle in. And there was some like important training I wanted to do. And, um, I like last Sunday, I like looked at the forecast and I was like, fuck, like it's already been dry for a couple of days. It's like, it's not going to get this good again. And I, I called the Met office and like paid for a forecast and they, they kind of like reiterated that they're like, yeah, September just like looks really unsettled and you know, who knows which way it'll go. And I had, I had raced something in the U S a ski record in the U S and I had jumped on a window and uh, a three day window. And there wasn't another weather window to race that mountain for another like six weeks after that. So I, I knew that was, that was kind of in the back of my mind. So I, I wasn't able to do, all the wrecking I wanted to, like, I wasn't sure certain about the line I was going to take between Dolly Wagon and Fairfield. Um, Finley went one way, Killian and Beth went another. Uh, I never had gone on broad stand. Um, I guess those are really the, the two, the two kind of major ones that I was, I was thinking about, but, um, yeah, I, I knew the route decently well. I mean, clearly you didn't, you weren't relying on your paces because by all accounts, you, you left them behind you. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't, I, that's, yeah, it like, so leg one. Yeah. I mean, leg one was, was very poorly paced. And as a pacer, that would have been, that would have been really hard to, to, to go on. So I, I certainly don't blame people for dropping off on leg one. Yeah. We lost, I lost, you know, three of the four pacers on leg one. Leg two, I think there's a chance I would have been in danger of dropping people, but I was so scared from leg one that I was like, okay, I just need to like take control and just like really, you know, not take pacers everywhere because it's just not necessary for them to go to every single summit, every single pacer. 
And then once I got to like three, um, you know, granted, those guys are carrying all my aid. They're refilling my stuff. You know, they're catching up to me. And they told me it was like about a race effort for them. But they went to every single peak. Um, Matt Atkinson was like navigating the whole thing. <laughs> it was like a it was like a savant or something. It was like incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was I was very good. And then like four, I think I was probably so the the pace had calmed down enough where it wasn't really a problem. And then leg five likewise and like the the guys on leg five were, were super quick so i don't think they would have an issue at any pace but um but you hit yeah. the road you changed your shoes and you hit the road <laughs> and that was it yeah 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 i um yeah i mean it was funny because like it's it's just really it's really hard like on the tranter the the terrain is so big that i find the navigation is a little bit easier because it's just it's more macro you can just follow a, a gps file it's like the lines are more obvious whereas i find like on some sections of the bob especially early on like three it's like so micro the route finding it's like not enough to follow a gpx like you really need to like i think matt told me like he goes back there and he runs and he times different lines and he um you know has like a huge notes in his phone where he has all this stuff broken out and it's it's just so boggy and grassy that trods don't really exist. And you have to be like, just, you know, very good at, at navigating to get through there. So. Amazing. Yeah. And your, your story um, was hilarious showing the difference between Killian's stop and yours. <laughs> Do you think that was, I mean, we all know we're not supposed to spend any time in checkpoints. Yeah. It was that, do you think that was a, a contributing factor that you just went through them? Yeah. So I, I think, I think that was, that stop that Killian had was indicative of two things. Like number one, it was how far ahead he was on pace and granted by the end of it, like he was pretty, he was, he was pretty heftily smoked by the end of it. Like, I mean, he, he, I think he did give it his all, but um, I think, yeah, the, 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 the environment was just a little bit more casual on, on some, on some elements of it. And certainly the way I structured my time was I knew Killian had done like one too fast. And so I was like, okay, I'll just do like one eight minutes slower and then I'll just hold that eight minute and then I won't make up any splits on Killian and I am just gonna not stop where he stopped and that should give me the record. Um, granted, I'd have to run all of his splits, but you know, that was, that was kind of the idea. Um, so, and then I think the second thing that's indicative is just like how much tactics have changed just in the last couple of years. And I think, um, like, you know, five, six years ago, it was, it was common to just stop in the aid stations, you know, that was kind of like, and I think it was, at least from my perspective, you know, racing on this like record scene, it was like kind of the influence of through hikers with this idea, like, Hey, you just like have to keep moving. Like, even if it's walking, like it'll make a big difference. Um, so yeah, I think, so just to reiterate, I think it's, Part of that was just killing a slightly more casual approach. He was so far ahead. And then, you know, he's, he's just not as motivated, I think, as I am by like going super fast. Like he's just out there, I think, genuinely to have fun a lot of times. And then I think the other half of it is, yeah, it's just tactics. So changing. What are your thoughts on sort of supported versus unsupported rounds? So looking at your list of uh, achievements on the FKT website. Some are supported, some are unsupported. Is is that through necessity, or is there a, a sort of a mindset behind that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it really comes down to. I mean, I think I, I think it's you could probably explain it a lot of different ways, but I think it really just comes down to how accessible the course is and whether it makes sense to have aid come in. So something like the Tranter is like something like the Tranter, and I think I would even say the Ramsey even though the Ramsey's a long way to go unsupported, probably makes sense uh, unsupported. Like I was really happy I did the Tranter unsupported. The Tranter would like not make sense as a supported effort just because it's just so remote and it's just kind of this like very remote, you know, kind of wild experience. Like it would be very contrived and difficult to get pacers back there. Uh, you're not You're not going through towns. There's like, you know, not even a ton of, grazing terrain right no there, there's quite a bit of grazing on the tranter but it's just like it's a more remote wild effort 
And I think for those, like the unsupported kind of goes, goes best. And I mean, totally like full credit to Finley for, for, for doing that. And, and uh, it was only after I ran the Tranter that I really realized like, wow, okay, that makes a lot of sense as an unsupported effort. And then the Bob, you know, it's, it's more of a, it's more of a cultural experience. You no, know, you're in the towns, there's lots of accessibility uh, for crew access. And I think it makes a lot of sense to do it, to do it with crew. I think a unsupported Bob, you know, maybe if it's uh if it's the only way you can do it is great, but I think it really, really makes sense to do it with like the full crew style. Yeah. Yeah. What did you make of your greeting when you arrived back at the moot hall? You know, I mean, I knew, I knew it was probably going to be something like that because I saw the videos of Killian finishing. Um, it was hard to like put myself in that and imagine that for me. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I mean, honestly, like, I, I don't even like, I, I just, you know, my brain was just, I knew, I mean, this sounds, this sounds bad possibly, but like my brain was so addled at that point that I was like, all these people are watching and like, I'm going to like, you know, do something really fucking dumb. I'm like, you know, cause in my own head, I'm like, you know, I want to give credit to, I want to give credit to all the people who supported me, but I don't want to get up here and like make some you know, I don't know what, some speech or something. So it was like, those things are easy to discuss, like now, like, you know, and I, I never was confident enough that I could sit down with Martin Stone before and be like, okay, you know, when I get the record, like, what are we going to do on the steps in Mood Hall? It's like, <laughs> but it's like at setting and like my brain is like so fucked up and like my pacers are coming up to me and I like don't even recognize them. Um, it's like, I, I was, I was very concerned that, you know, I was, you know, God knows what sort of like social faux pas I was like, you know, committing in that moment. But yeah, it was, it was, it was super incredible. And like the, the route, um, I mean, that'll, the whole experience will go down as like definitely is the most incredible in my life so far. Um, so cool. yeah, it was, it was pretty, yeah. Uh, I was watching your videos on Instagram. Your, you, so previously you'd been doing the, your ski mountaineering, um, going up, going up a mountain and then coming down it through a tiny tunnel channel whatever they're called on your skis what how can you just sort of go to running after such a an extreme experience doing a, a sort of a record going up and down a mountain um i mean there are sections of the bob that are i would say are pretty extreme that like the like the descent off robinson and is like pretty burly and uh halls fell is pretty burly you know broad stand is is uh you know i don't know what grade three or harder scramble and um so i mean and then when you're running on those rocks like even coming off like i don't know what it is broad crack maybe like you know there's some definitely some fall potential so it is i would that is to say it's definitely also exciting to do something like the bob um yeah. And a lot of the same, the same fitness and same skills apply between, between the two of them. It's just a slightly different pair of footwear. Um, really. And slightly, slightly different. <laughs> Say again. Slightly more comfortable. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know. Some of those ski boots are pretty, pretty comfortable. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I find when I finish my running, when I finish skiing season, I have to spend about a week. Like it takes me a week before I like running again. Um, because the experience is just, I find it's just like very different. Like running is like more almost like meditative and it's like this experience that like is, is not as enjoyable in the moment as skiing is, but it's, it's, it's so easy compared to skiing from like an equipment and a conditions perspective. It's just like much more relaxing and you're just like in this level of effort. And whereas skiing, it's like the uphill is hard. It's got tons yeah. of equipment. It's got, you know, you got tons of gear. It's like scary uh, from like an avalanche perspective or a fall perspective or, you know, a bunch of other problems you can have. But like the skiing downhill is like incredibly fun and it's like really beautiful and you can like make your own line. So there's like really, there's like, there's benefits to each. And I find like each season, it takes me a little while to kind of like, like the other one. And then I like really like it. And then end of the season, I kind of get sick of it. But uh, yeah, so. You said it's best outside of events. Do you think that's the same for running? Do you think these sort of individual challenges and records are better than doing an event? 
I mean, I, it kind of, I think skiing is a little bit different. Well, it's a little bit different in the U S for skiing and running because a lot of our terrain is so protected. Like you would never have like the Ben Nevis race. You would never have a race up and down Mount Whitney in the United States because of the environmental protection. So oh. in the U S if you want to race on this more rugged terrain in the more wild environments, you have to do it okay. outside of a and whereas in the UK, you could kind of do it in either. I don't like the way races in the US are so big and kind of commercialized and over the top, uh, like the races, like some races are in, in, in UK and most races are in Europe. But I think the UK fell racing scene is, is very cool. And I think, you know, I'd consider coming back and racing Borrowdale. The only, the only reason I... I would be cautious if we're coming back for Borrowdale is uh, just like you could just show up on a day and there's the conditions are shit, you know? Um, and that's like, uh, I don't know. It's like not quite as fun. Um, that's the UK for you. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was it's too funny. I meant to post on my Instagram about it. I, I probably will. I was just laughing so hard. Um, you know, I used to race a lot in New Hampshire and like Mount Washington is like, you know, they love to say it's like the worst weather in the world. And then, I come here and uh, the wettest uh, inhabited place in the UK is like, you know, the sea toller area is like the heart of the Borrowdale Valley. And it's like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Like, you know, I got to, well, I got to pick areas. I got to like start racing in Arizona or something, something where the weather is <laughs> distant. Um, oh, cool. Well, what's, um, are you, are you going to stay for long? Are you going to go and smash something in the rails? <laughs> what, what's, what's next? Um, no, I mean, I figure if any time of the year makes sense for me, like not really to do anything and take some time off, it's, it's probably now. So I'm just like taking some time kind of easy. I mean, I, I intentionally didn't put anything on my schedule after the Bob. Um, I think hypothetical fantasy world, like if, if I went back to the States, like maybe in October, I would redo something. I did in the past, like less than four hours or so. Like I, I, I wouldn't, I even doubt that though. Like I'm, I'm probably just done for the season and I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick up racing in, in the spring with skiing. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just nice. The only, the only other thing I consider doing is maybe doing a foul race, um, either something, uh, low key in the lakes, or I would love to see, I got to look what, um, my my old Finley's doing uh Mr. Wild and see if he's got any races. Um because that could be that could be pretty entertaining. Put so. yourself against him over something short. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's yeah, a shame, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a shame your 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 Bob was was uh at the same time or just before the, the, the Ben Nevis race. That would that would have been a good one. No, I think that would have been really that would have been fantastic. And then the other one would have been really cool have been Trophy Okima which Finley just won over in Italy, um, which is like, uh, 50 K and like, uh, 12,000 feet of climbing maybe. And he, he just won it. And his time was one minute off Killian's time. And he got like lost on, he got off course because of like poor course marking. So I think I was kicking myself. I was like, shit, like either one of those would have been awesome to do. But I mean, I'm certainly, I, I have no regrets doing it the way I did it. You know, it's not like I wished I was like, oh, I'll do the Ben race and I'll do the Bob at the end of the month. Like that wouldn't have worked. So um, oh, there's lots of, there's lots of fantastic races out there. So, yeah. Are, so you're going to hang around for a little bit. Are we going to see you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm debate. I'm like, I'm, I'm like very torn, you know, as to what I want to do. Cause like part of me, like I'm in this Mazda, I live in this like Mazda bongo that I bought and it's like getting really old. And, um, so <laughs> But I, I did pay, it was like 200 pounds a month almost to insure this thing. Cause like coming from America, you know, oh. they didn't, I don't know, recognize my previous driving history. So it is insured for the rest of the month. So that's like a slight factor kind of driving me to stay. And like, you know, I have a car and like, I've been here and I have all my stuff here. Like, you know, it, it, I feel like it makes sense. Honestly, what the move is probably is for me to go and like think of any races I'd ever want to do in the, in years to come and to go and recce them right now. So like go and recce, run a couple laps of like Borrowdale and then yeah. maybe you know, I can come back and I, I don't need to do a huge block, try to recce it right before the race or something. Um, yeah. so yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Okay.
Congratulations yeah. again. That was uh, possibly yeah. one of the most exciting dot watchings I've, I've done for a while. Oh, really? when, um, when, when, when did you start watching? When? Yeah. Um, lunchtime, Friday. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Like, it was, uh, you know, the, 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 the word hit the street and, and, yeah, it was like, wow, what, what is this guy? And he's ahead of Killian. <laughs> and you stayed ahead of Killian. And that was, uh, yeah. And then watching your dot increase your lead over Killian as you hit the road was, was like the trophy was left behind. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. Um, Martin Stone, he told me that that was the craziest. He, he, he thinks that that was the craziest Bob Graham that's like ever happened in history. Cause there was just like, like we had just beyond like all the, the, the kind of like dropping pacers and we had other like issues with like water and uh, there were some other stuff, but like beyond, beyond that, we also, uh, on like one, I had a bag with like my, I had a bum bag with basically like my cell phone, like a, the pacer tracker, earbuds, salt capsules, caffeine pills. And that got shuffled between pacers as they were dropped. And basically one of the pacers threw it in his vest and it bounced out of his vest on great Calva. And he got almost all the way up. He chased, he, we had dropped him and he chased us all the way up great Calva, uh, all the way up Blancathra before he realized it was back there. And he like had to get to work and he went and he had to look for it for like an hour and a half in the grass. And he was calling the crew and the crew was like trying to walk him on to like where the tracker was. And like, then he like got it. He like ran off, ran to the road and then they got a ride to Dunmail and they got the tracker and like this spare tracker and like my phone and earbuds like there like five minutes before I got there. And I mean, not like it would have been a big deal, but like the earbuds and music like definitely probably shaved, you know, I don't know three or four or five minutes off of like three. So like that made a big difference. And then uh, the other one was like leg, Billy Cartwright ran all leg one with me. And then I was concerned about the leg two pacers, like nothing against them, just based on what happened on leg one. So I kept Billy on for leg two and he had no food and water. And uh, he was just <laughs> like, you know, trying, like as we hit, like we, people like hiked in water for us and like he was just taking any food he could get off of them. Yeah. And um uh, and then he didn't realize where the route went and we ran up Fairfield and he thought it went down to Great Rig. And so he just, he just, you know, skirted the summit and then just ran to Great Rig. And we're, like, we're yelling at him and like, he just like disappeared into the distance. Oh, and no. so I think, I think his like, uh, <laughs> I think like it was like a couple hours later, like his, uh, I don't know if Nick Jackson is his, his girlfriend or wife or, uh, but she got a like phone call from Grasmere that he was like, you know, I don't know what, in a pub or something in Grasmere, like wait. <laughs> um, not, this is a this is a this is sounding quite chaotic <laughs> uh, it was extremely chaotic yeah yeah it was extremely chaotic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. wow so, extra kudos to you then <laughs> oh yeah thank you thank you well mainly to my crew i mean the crew was really the ones who yeah. were dealing with all that no that's a uh, the paces do a lot of work for sure and uh, and you yeah. know not only looking after you but yeah setting the you know going down good lines and carrying your staff and providing that support there's there's no doubt we all we all know what the paces do for sure yeah and they were they were enormously enormously helpful and they're the ones that really made not only made the effort happen but like made it like really really special um and uh and wasn't just them it was also you know folks who you know, Tori Miller, uh, she like baked pastries for the pacers. <laughs> she like couldn't make it out to road support too much, but she was like, okay, I'm just going to like bake like hundreds of pastries for the pacers. And so, yeah. and like uh, on my Strava, if you look at my Strava activity, I break out all the, I, I list all the pacers and road support out. So. Oh, yeah. cool. I'll go and stalk Strava. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. Really appreciate it. And all the best to yeah. you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Have a good one. Talk Take to you later. care. Bye. Bye.